Gary DePaul with Unlabeled Leadership. Welcome to episode 53, Ronald Graves Illuminates Three Harmful Assumptions. Here's a shout out to listeners in Hesse, Germany, in württemberg Germany, and in Nigeria. With that, let's get started. If you kept up with the shows, you would recognize the name Ronald Graves from episode 8, entitled Ronald Graves Differentiates the Coaching Role. Ronald is my executive coach, and he's also a leadership expert. He has more than 35 years of business consulting, and he has worked for companies in the area of risk management for a number of those years. Oh, and one more notation about Ronald. Ronald has his Certified Performance Technologist designation from the International Society for Performance Improvement, which is commonly known as ISPI. In my book, Nine Practices of 21st Century Leadership, I identify 13 leadership assumptions, traditional assumptions, and I derived them from my research when I did an analysis of 16 leadership books that were published in this century. The assumptions are faulty, and they're harmful. If you want to disengage employees, then these assumptions will help you do that. Oh, and one more thing. When I did speaking engagements talking about leadership, and when I talked about the 13 assumptions, I was surprised at the number of people that said they saw those assumptions being played out by their bosses, their employers. Unfortunately, the behavior of too many bosses indicate that they buy into these assumptions, or a number of them. Part 1. Recognition is a formal process. From my list of assumptions, this is number 11. If you report to someone who doesn't give you acknowledgement for the work that you do, doesn't give you feedback on a regular basis, then you may have someone that follows this assumption. People who follow this assumption often believe that recognition, it's not necessary, unless, of course, the organization requires it. And they also might think that people know of their value, and they don't need to be told that. And also, they might believe that too much recognition is counter-effective. I asked Ronald if he would demystify this assumption. Here he is. Really, I think there's two kinds of recognition, team recognition and individual recognition. I'm only going to say one thing about team recognition. As a leader, your team receives 100% the credit for every victory that you have, every win that you have. Even if you as the leader are responsible for the majority of the work that went into that victory, even maybe 90 or 95% of it, you take no credit for the success. It all belongs to the team. Now, that's a concept that I... Um, I heard early early in my uh, leadership career, but it was hard for me to grasp. I didn't believe it. I didn't want to try it. So I just put it off as long as I could. Finally, I thought, you know, I'm just going to give that a try and see if I'm right. I hope I am. But, you know, I did it and gave my team total credit for something that I had a big part in. My team after this was so fired up that they lifted their performance way above where it was before. I could never have achieved that level of commitment and that level of energy from my team had I not done that. I could have given 100 motivational speeches to get them all pumped up and not had half the impact that just giving them the credit for the victory did that. And the other thing it did was it created great loyalty because that kind of loyalty I couldn't have gotten any other way. I think they realized that, you know, I put them first. For a leader, recognizing someone is putting them first, whether it's a team or whether it's an individual. By the fact that I put them first, which I didn't have to do, I think they recognized that. In fact, it may have been the first time that some of those people had ever been recognized for anything, individually or in a team environment. So it only took me that one time. I was completely convinced. From that point on, I always gave the credit away and it always worked. Part of traditional leadership is, and it's a shame that it happens. And when I say traditional leadership, I'm talking about the negativity of some of the behaviors of those who think they're practicing leadership. And it it may not even be considered as leadership with this concept of giving credit to the team. Too many people take the credit as the manager of the team. They take ownership and they don't give the recognition that they should to the people that are on their team. And it has just the opposite effect. And it's encouraging when you're talking about this concept of giving credit, how it becomes a victory for your team and creates loyalty. It's powerful. I I had no idea until I gave it a try. (laughs) Then I was convinced. 
There's also individual recognition. And I know your book mentions this, but some leaders believe that you don't need to recognize people because they already know how good they are. They know how well they're doing. I guess my question is, how do they know that? There's no way for them to know that. They just have to kind of guess at it. Let me ask you a question, Gary. You ever met somebody who was overpraised their entire life? I mean, you know, when they were a child, their parents just gave them all kinds of praise and encouragement, telling them how great they were and how much potential they had and how they were behind them. And then they go to school and teachers were heaping praise on them and saying what a great student they were and how honored they were to have them in their class. And then they go out in the workplace and their first boss is telling them, wow, you got great potential. I'm so glad we hired you. I can see you going a long way in this company. You ever met anybody like that? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No, there's no people like that. I think recognition is, is like a human psychological need. I think that's just part of our makeup. We need recognition. We need affirmation. We need all of that. And we're all starved for it. Everyone is deficient in their need for recognition. So we're kind of all missing, missing that you know, emotional support that we need, particularly in the workplace. I think employees are kind of recognition deficient. They don't know how well they're doing. Let me just give you an example. Let's say you're my boss. Okay. All right. So I think I'm doing a good job. In fact, right now, I've just convinced myself I'm doing a great job. But I don't know that you think I'm doing a great job, okay? You might really think I'm doing a subpar job or an inadequate job. And I think I'm doing a great job. So we have a little disconnect here, Gary. Or on the other side, I think I'm doing a poor job. And yet you think I'm the star of the team. In fact, you know, you brag on me to your superiors. And I don't have a clue about that. I don't know that. I just think I'm frustrated. I can't get things right. I think I'm failing here. Since I don't know that, I don't have a clue. I decide to leave your company because I don't think I'm measuring up. And I really want to go find a job where I can succeed. All along, you think I'm a superstar, but you're not telling me. Guess what? You lose me as an employee. I'm one of your best employees, but I don't know it. So I'm discouraged. I'm frustrated. And I want to find something where I can succeed. Sound like you know a possible scenario? There's a real possibility that there's incongruency between how you think you're doing, whether it's poor or great, and how the boss thinks you're doing, whether it's poor or great. And if those are out of sync, then just like you said, someone might leave the company because just because of that. Get discouraged. There's no reason for me to get discouraged, but that's how I feel. And you don't know how I feel, nor do I know how you feel. But, but as a leader, Gary, you know, even though you're maybe not telling me how good I'm doing, I guarantee you that you like recognition from your superior. You know, you're looking for that recognition from the higher ups, maybe the C-suite people or whatever. So you crave that from them, but you're not willing to provide recognition to those people you lead. I guarantee you that most leaders are looking for recognition, even though they don't want to give it. That's also kind of, you know, out of sync. What you need is not what you're giving to your people. Just listening to you talk about that, something that comes to mind is that there seems to be an underlying belief that recognition is something that has a limited, there's like a limited amount. If you give out too much, then something bad is going to happen. There's going to be negative consequences for that. And it's very interesting that they may not think that way, but they behave that way. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a formal process. Just tell me how I'm doing. You don't need to bring me in and, you know, have all these forms and all these diagrams and all these and all this data to prove whether I'm doing good or bad. I'm doing a good job. Just recognize it. Say, hey, Ron, I like the way you're doing that. Great job. Keep it up. It's all it takes to give me encouragement, to give me confirmation, to motivate me to do even better. Part two, leadership requires little or no training. On my list of traditional leadership assumptions, this one is number 12. People who assume this often believe that because of their initial success, they've mastered leadership. And they think that leadership is a simple concept. You don't need any ongoing training to be able to do it right. As with the first one, Ronald demystifies why this assumption is harmful. Here's Ronald. You know, the theory that leaders are born couldn't be any further from the truth. If there is such a thing as a leadership gene, I don't think too many people have it. And even if they do have it, it has to be developed like any other skill or trait that you have. You know, there aren't any born leaders out there to just grow up and walk into life and poof, they take over leadership. More often, people are promoted into leadership positions, and unfortunately, because they're the best performer on the team. Yeah. If you're the best worker, you get to be the boss. So once promoted, they really don't become leaders, they become managers. And there's a very big difference between being a manager and being a leader. One of my um, favorite sayings about that is that, you know, a manager manages work while a leader leads people. Mm. Trust me, leading people is a whole lot different challenge than managing the work. It's a different skill set. Very different skill set. People are a little harder to manage than the work is. 
So those who believe they've mastered leadership without any training have actually mastered management. There's a big difference between that two. What they end up being is, is what I call level one leaders. Level one leaders is the lowest level of the five levels of leadership. That's known as a positional leader. They lead only because they have a leadership title. They have no leadership skills, but they have a leadership title. People only follow level one leaders because they have to. They're assigned to them, essentially. You're assigned to them, and this is your leader. This is your boss. Do what this boss says. Now, in the 20th century, you know, it was known for the command and control leadership. Workers did what they were told, and they were just glad to have a job and you know have a good employer. They were loyal. They worked their 40 years with one company, retired with a gold watch and a great pension. We all know that's long gone, all right? Oh, yeah. And in those days, the leader was the smartest person in the company, basically the subject matter expert. You're the subject matter expert. You do the best job. You become the leader, and you tell everybody else what to do. And that worked good. Back in the second half of the 20th century, that worked great. It worked great because you had two generations, right? At that time, you had the the silent generation and you had the baby boomers and they were very command and control oriented. They they took orders. They did what they were supposed to do. They didn't speak up a lot and they just stayed there loyally to the company until it was time to retire. But today's workplace, you know, those two generations are leaving the workplace. There's a few of the silent generation left and there's a few more boomers left like me. You know, they're being replaced by the X gens, the millennials and the Generation Z. Anybody born between 1965 and 2010, that 45-year span, is now making up the majority of the workforce. And these individuals were raised in a totally different world, totally different environment, and they need different leadership. And so the command and control no longer works. In fact, it has a negative effect on the 21st century worker. No longer being the smartest person, being the subject matter expert, knowing more than anybody else is important because you know, your IQ is taking on less and less importance now in the, as a 21st century leader. In fact, IQ only contributes to about 6% of the average leader's success. That's, that's pretty small. That's real small. Yeah. Today, it's EQ, emotional intelligence, which contributes to an average of 33% of the leader's success. Your emotional intelligence is five times as important in your leadership as your, your IQ. EQ includes such things as self-awareness, self-expression, and the biggie, people skills, Trust me, not a lot of people are born with that gene that you know makes them have great people skills. Decision making and the ability to deal with stress. Those are the five areas that make up your EQ. If a leader believes that he or she doesn't need training because they're the most experienced and the smartest person in the room, that ain't it. Think again about that because if you want to be a successful 21st century leader, you need to develop your soft skills. And that requires work and training and then a whole new mindset. I'm thinking about what you were saying about like in the early 20th century about how that is so different and thinking about that, the environment definitely was different. You have now a lot of information-based organizations, whereas back then there was a lot less of that and more physical labor. So the idea of command and control would work better in those environments. But now if you have a company that's knowledge-based, that relies on creativity, innovation, the the traditional way, just like you're saying, just wouldn't work. Just imagine if you had a traditional company that was a factory, for example, for some reason, management adapted 21st century thinking about how how leadership should be, even though it may not have been called for. Just imagine what how that could be different. Yeah, very different. These three generations I was talking about all grew up in, in different eras. And the things they grew up with kind of formed how they think, how they view leadership, how they view the government, how they how they view all that. And it's you've got to adapt. And besides, in today's work environment, you know, we got smart machines. The machines are more intelligent than the leaders are. Mm, yeah. The machines have taken over all that IQ, that intelligence part. You know, your smart machines and your and your all that. What machines can't do is they can't relate to people. They have no feelings, they have no ability. They have no people skills. So the 21st century leader now is the people skill person, not the intelligence person. It's a a huge shift. And if you've got any leaders out there who, you know, came through the command and control, they got to shift gears. They want to be successful. Now, when someone steps into a management position, the idea of fake it till you make it and just figure it out on the job, it's not enough. Yeah. Let me give you, for instance, Leaders always complaining about the millennials. So let me let me just give you a little bit about millennials from some of the things that I've, I've learned. The good things about millennials, which a lot of people don't emphasize, but they're you know they do have some great things. One in every three workers is a millennial. They have a significant impact on team dynamics. They were um, a greatest challenge for most leaders lies with their complexity. 
Millennials are technically savvy, ambitious, goal-oriented, collaborative, and highly creative. They're open-minded, confident, receptive to new ideas, and have high expectations. I don't think leaders see that in millennials. They just see this other side, some of these traits that leaders have problem with. Um, They're not into overtime. They tend to view work as a necessary activity kind of to fill the gap between weekends, holidays, and vacations. They need regular supervision because they're somewhat experienced, they're unstructured, and they generally lack discipline. They don't like routine, repetitive work, and they're impatient. A leader working with a third of the workforce now, which is the millennials, when you are leading them, you need to coach them and not command them. They want to perform meaningful, challenging work with flexibility and fun. They want to be transparent while trusting. While you trust them, they want you to be transparent as a leader. They want a positive work culture where they can foster relationships with their coworkers, and they crave a stable environment that provides challenges on a regular basis. That doesn't sound like command and control to me. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Because of the way they grew up and because of, you know, they, they, were, they were basically the first ones to have you know, a lot of electronics, they have a different need. And as a leader, you need to understand what your people need. That's kind of the learning process, learning what you have in your in your organization and what you have in your people and being able to fit your leadership style to your workers rather than the other way around. Because if you want your workers to fit their style to your leadership, they're going to be leaving you. <laughs> yep. So finding somebody who understands them. Part three, leaders know how effective their leadership is. People who believe in Assumption 13 often think that their leadership is self-apparent and effective, and they assume that their behavior has positive impact on all their employees, and that examining leadership or their own leadership is a waste of time. Having coached professionals at all career levels, Ronald does not buy into this assumption at all. He has some insight into the problems with this assumption. Here he is. Leaders are somewhat afraid of feedback. They kind of shy away from it because, as you said, they think they know it all about how good they are or how good they aren't. If they're such great leaders, why are they afraid of getting feedback and getting verification of their their leadership skill? And I work in the world of U.S. manufacturing. In this world, we have measures for everything. I mean, everything. Quality, productivity, safety, profitability, waste, energy, consumption, cycle times, error rate. I could go on for another five minutes on that. Leaders in the manufacturing world have KPIs in front of them for virtually anything they could ever need, anytime they could ever need it. It's always at their fingertips. But leadership measurements, that's a whole different story. Don't even have a lot of those data points that tell us, you know, we're on target, we're not on target with our leadership. And, you know, as I was preparing for this podcast today and looking at that number 13 there, how leaders know how effective their leadership is, I realized that a couple of years ago, I created a tool called the Performance Evaluation Matrix, which I just referred to as the matrix, which is designed to measure employee performance. But it has another element to it that actually measures supervisor performance or leadership performance. The matrix focuses on the environment in which the employee works. As opposed to trying to change the workers, it focuses on the environment. It focuses on how well the organization and how well the leader, supervisor, manager, whichever, provides all the tools necessary for that employee to succeed. It addresses six different support factors. One of those support factors goes back to our first question today on recognition, consequences, incentives, and rewards is right down that recognition alley. It's got six different areas we measure. It also has four different ratings, anywhere from poor to excellent. So it creates a mechanism to evaluate the effectiveness of each of those factors. And you can score those factors and you can have a total score. What is unique about it is it's administered on two different levels. On level one, all we do is ask the worker's supervisor, the worker's leader, to sit down with this document and rate how well they think they are doing as a supervisor in providing all of these tools to the employees. So the supervisor, manager, leader sits down with this document and scores themselves, basically, and scores the company. And they complete that without any input from the worker. Now, in level two, someone other than the leader, someone other than the the worker's direct manager, interviews the worker, asking them how effectively they believe they are supported in these six factors. Ah. We have two evaluations. We've got the supervisor evaluation of how well they're doing in the company. And we have the employee's evaluation, a reality about how well they feel the supervisor, the manager is supporting them and the company is supporting them. And when we get those two done, which take just a few minutes to do. And the third independent person is asked to compare the level one, the supervisor did, level two that the employee did and compare the results. They compare the leader's assessment of how well they are supporting the worker to how well the worker believes they are supported by their supervisor or their leader, and in turn, how well they're supported by the company. 
So results provide the leader with an assessment of how well they're doing compared to how well they think they're doing. What it does is compares the leader's perception to the worker's reality. I can tell you that in a lot of cases, those don't line up perfectly. That's where you start having your incongruence between what the person in the management position is thinking versus what the worker's thinking, but you're making it explicit when you're using this tool. Yeah. If the leader feels that they know how well, how effective their leadership is, and they're going to, you know, just do it that way. A lot of times, you know, they're kind of surprised. Leaders who believe they're doing an effective job in the absence of any valid proof, which this does, and those leaders who think that they can be a great leader without having training, those two groups of leaders find out that the assessment is very far off. How that well they think they are with a lack of training and with lack of feedback is very different than the perception. Their perception is very different than what the reality is in the workplace. I'm thinking about this tool and I'm wondering if there's another app, a different application that you can use it for. And that is among peers on how teams work. So if you take an executive level team like the C-suite and you administer this tool for how you think you work with your peers and your peers rate you on how they think you'd work, I bet you could use it that way. And you'd also find some incongruencies between what the, the person being assessed and self-assessed believe. Yeah, it, it's there's a lot of different ways. I probably have to change the categories just a little bit, but essentially the, the, the concept of it would be the same in, in, in using it in different ways of evaluating. The good thing about it is it's very easy to assess. It doesn't take you know, a lot of work. It just takes a lot of thought in those six areas. And again, the way it scores, you come up with a score in each section of the six sections, you can come up with an overall scores. So you can apply it to a lot of different variables. I see it also as being a great way of priming how people think about how they interact with the people that report to them, that once you've gone through this assessment, in a way, it could give you permission and give your workers permission to start talking about this, this stuff openly so that you be less reliant on this tool and more reliant on honest feedback, both up and down the hierarchy. Definitely. And the other thing it can do is it can be a great tool for leadership development training. And you work on the areas where you're weak. I'm a big believer in working to your strengths. But when it comes to things like this, where the perception of how good you are is different than your than your own perception, you kind of shore up those areas where um, you're not communicating well. The soft skills now of communication, this is, this is a tool to kind of help you realize how well you're communicating with your people and how well your people are, are perceiving your own communication. I love the idea of it being a development tool where you may focus on one thing at a time or two of them at a time, but then you reassess and that's where either you can reassess with the tool or you can work with your coach, if you have a coach, mm -hmm. with what else you can work on based on that feedback or just use the tool again to find out where your strengths are and where you can improve. Yeah. I'll give one word of advice. Leave your ego at the door. <laughs> yeah. When we're doing any kind of you know assessment, leave your ego at the door because I think a lot of maybe a lot of the reason that leaders are afraid of, of these feedback mechanisms is that it's going to damage their ego. And maybe they're not as good as they think they are, but they don't want to know about it. If you don't know, then it can't hurt you. Another one of my favorite truisms is that people don't leave companies, they leave leaders. Yeah. And if you are not giving your employees all the tools and skills they need, everything they need to be successful, then eventually your turnover rate is going to be high. So I think that you'll find that those leaders who don't believe they need training, don't believe they need to recognize people and believe they know exactly how good they are. I think you'll find those leaders probably have a higher turnover rate in their department or in their teams than those leaders who actually follow the, the, the totally opposite mantra that, yes, we need to recognize people. Yes, I need to be continually growing as a leader. And three, I need to get some kind of feedback. I need some kind of a scorecard to know where I stand, whether I'm doing a great job, a poor job, an in-between job, and where can I get to do a better job. Those leaders, I guarantee you, will have a lower turnover rate on their teams as well. My thanks to Ronald Graves. If you'd like to learn more about Ronald, go to the show notes. And if you have a question or comment, go to unlabelleadership.com leave a voicemail message up to one minute by clicking the message icon. I'd like to thank those who contribute to the show. Your contributions help with the production expenses. But mostly, I'd like to thank you, the listener, for just doing that, listening. Until next time, lead on! <laughs>